Wentworth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today we are assembled again to say farewell to one of our nation's great leaders. We've said farewell to Gough Whitlam this year, and now we say farewell to Malcolm Fraser. Malcolm Fraser has, as many speakers have noted, been defined by his great uh, conflict with Gough Whitlam. Not in his own mind and not in our minds. Not in our minds. That was an extraordinary conflagration in our political life. It's one that Australians will talk about and read about and school children will study for forever, for centuries, as long as our nation exists. But Malcolm Fraser was a remarkable man, a remarkable progressive liberal. The term progressive has been used a few times in this debate already today. It's been suggested that uh, Malcolm Fraser in his later years became beloved of progressives. Malcolm Fraser was always progressive. And he said right back in the early 1960s, he noted on one occasion how remarkable it was <coughs> that people who opposed the tyranny of the Soviet Union were regarded as extreme reactionary conservatives, but those who favoured uh, a more lenient approach, those who favoured some form of accommodation with the Soviet Union were regarded as progressives. And yet were not those, he asked, who fought for freedom and democracy and individual liberty, were they not the true progressives? I think we'd all agree now with the 2020 vision of hindsight that they were. Madam Speaker, before I go on, let me say a little about the centrality of Malcolm Fraser's life. At the centre of his life, at the very heart of his life, was a great love story a great love story. He and Tammy were married in 1956. He was 26 years of age and she was 20. She spent, so she entered barely, barely out of her teens. She is suddenly the wife of a member of parliament. And we all know what a tough road it is for the wives and families of parliamentarians. Our own prime minister has said many times and very insightfully, that all of us here are volunteers, our families are the conscripts. And Tammy managed her family of four children, Mark, Angela, Hugh and Phoebe, she managed all of that without any of the conveniences of modern life that we take for granted, email, uh, cheap telephony, sealed roads, managed to move that family around from Canberra to, to Wannan to Melbourne, all around the country, keeping it all together in that time. The Deputy Prime Minister, the leader of the National Party, spoke uh, of the great friendship between Doug Anthony and Malcolm Fraser, and it was a very deep friendship. And they were, they were citizens, arm in arm, Madam Speaker, as you would recall. You were on the other side, as I recall. They were Doug Anthony and Malcolm Fraser were citizens, arm in arm, on the side of the yes vote in the Republic campaign. Uh, and though, that you could see the affection between them. But that relationship, that relationship was struck between their wives, between their wives when uh, the, um, uh, in, the, in 1957, uh, Margot, uh, Doug Anthony became elected to parliament, surprisingly. It was as much of a surprise to him as it was to Malcolm Fraser. Malcolm threw his hat in the ring in a pre-selection as a young man of 24, thinking he would have uh, no prospects. And of course, Doug Anthony was thrust into parliament uh, un unexpectedly because his father, who preceded him in the seat, had died. Uh, so he had two young wives, Margot and Tammy, here in Canberra, a very cold place, as Tammy once said, seemed to be full of old, old, grey, bald men. So uh, <laughs> what does that? 
Nothing's changed, I heard somebody say, Madam Speaker. That's a very harsh comment. But um, perhaps, perhaps there are not quite, not quite as many uh, men as there used to be. But nonetheless, still, I think we would all agree too many, <laughs> but relative to the women. Uh, but the, uh, but, but those, that pair formed a bond. They were having their first babies together, both young women, both in this pretty tough environment. So, Madam Speaker, above all, and I know that Malcolm's family will, will recognise, out of all of this and the, the uh, discussion of his great achievements, to which I'll turn in a moment, out of all of this is this House's, this Parliament's, this nation's love to them, to the family, recognising their grief, uh, their loss, and above all, honouring that great love story which was the foundation of Malcolm and Tammy's joint expedition into the public life of Australia and all the achievements that flowed from that. Now, I should say a little bit about Malcolm Fraser's uh, demeanour. He was elected to parliament as the youngest member of parliament at the time, quite uh, at uh, 24, but he was also the tallest. And, uh, but he, he had always, partly I think because of his height, a, uh, uh, the member for Longman, uh, Madam Speaker, should not feel that as a backhanded uh, <laughs> So, uh, but the, the, unlike the member for Longman, the then member for Wannan, the young member for Wannan, had a, uh, had a, ch had a chilly demeanour. Uh, he was shy. Uh, and I think a lot of people took that for a for a real personal coldness, which was not the case. Malcolm Fraser was a shy man, uh, and in some, in, in some cases uh, that, was, that was really misinterpreted, and that coupled with his height, a rather austere appearance, the farmer from the Western District, it was easy to paint a caricature, particularly contrary to the flamboyance of Gough Whitlam or, indeed, the, the extraordinary gregarious conviviality of Bob Hawke that succeeded him. But he was always uh, a very droll man. A very, he had a very good sense of humour. And I want to uh, recall, Madam Speaker, a letter that Malcolm Fraser wrote to the Melbourne Sun on the 3rd of June 1954, uh, after he had only just failed to win the seat of Wannan from the Labor Party. The Labor was a, it was a Labor seat. He nearly won it, lost by a few hundred votes, and then, of course, won it the next election and then built up his majority till it became a very safe seat. But he wrote this letter following that, uh, that election. Sir, in the, case of the, in the course of the recent federal election campaign, statements have been made in the Melbourne press with respect to my football activities past and future. These statements have been quoted as having been made by me. All are untrue. I did not say I played Australian rules football for Melbourne Grammar or Rugger for Oxford University. No local team in the Western District has ever approached me to play football. The only position that I would be qualified to fill on a football field would be that of a goalpost. <laughs> now, <laughs> for a a shy 24-year-old, honourable members can understand, he had a very good sense of humour. Now, Madam Speaker, often governments and politicians and leaders get credit for doing things that would have happened anyway, because the tenor of the times is such that certain reform was inevitably going to happen, and the <laughs> respective government or prime minister, uh, or minister for that matter, is Johnny on the spot who happens to be there to make the decision that had to be made. But the real mark of political achievement is when leaders actually change history, when they do things that are different. And Fraser had a very deep sense of this. After all, as the Treasurer who's not here anymore, but the, the Treasurer was saying, sorry, he vanished. It's quite a feat. <laughs> but the, uh, as the Treasurer was saying earlier, as the Treasurer was saying earlier, uh, in his speech, in his Deacon lecture, and he had made the line, life is not meant to be easy, he was actually summarising Arnold Toynbee's uh, 12 volumes, which was quite, quite an achievement, which he'd studied at Oxford. And Toynbee's thesis really was that 
Civilizations basically give they, they're not destroyed by exter external forces, they commit suicide, they give up. And he made the point that we have to keep on, we have to keep on fighting, we have to recognise we've got big challenges and keep on going at them. So that's what he meant. It wasn't uh, uh, at all the sort of smug remark that it was later represented to be. But when you look at what he did in respect of shaping the nature of Australia today, it is really quite remarkable. I mean, what, what, when you sum up Australia to uh, a foreign friend, one of the first things you'd say is this is the most successful multicultural society in the world. There is no, no country in the world that has a higher percentage of immigrants, that's to say people who were born outside of Australia, no, no, not one, no comparable country has as high a percentage. America, supposedly the melting pot, has half the percentage. And ours is so diverse. How have we been able to do that so successfully? Well, this has been the work of generations and of, and of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Australians. Ultimately, it comes from the good sense and big-heartedness of Australians. I've seen enormous leadership from those in this chamber. Of course, the member for Barara, who I know will speak later, uh, is uh, one of the great architects of this. But Malcolm Fraser was so far ahead of his time. He was the first federal politician, as far as we know, certainly the first minister ever to use the term multiculturalism and talk about multiculturalism. And he did so in a speech to the State Zionist Council of New South Wales in 1969. That is a full four years before Al Grasby, uh, described as the father of multiculturalism, uh, became a minister. And you can see here, Madam Speaker, where impressions can be so misleading. Malcolm Fraser, the tall, rather austere, uh, double, you know, uh, uh, suited with a waistcoat, generally with a waistcoat, sort of stiff English shoes, looking very much the creation of the establishment. Undoubtedly a member, a scion, if you like, of the Protestant ascendancy in the Victorian establishment. So it's easy to put him into that conservative box. And Al Grasby, of course, with his moustache, his purple suits and so forth, clearly, clearly a progressive and a, and a, and a radical. But there was Malcolm Fraser, four years before, in office, making those very points. Now, he, his views on this matter, I think, were in large part formed by sectarianism. He, as I said, he grew up in, a, in the days when sectarianism was, was much stronger. Of course, he was, went into politics at the time of the Labor split. Uh, he was very close to B. A. Santa Maria. Uh, that's quite a tradition with prime ministers on our side. So it seems the, uh, that's a compliment. They, they, these, they, they have no. They, they laugh. They laugh at. They laugh at anything. They laugh at anything. They're easily amused, Mr. Prime Minister. But he. But he. Fraser deplored the way Billy Hughes, in the First World War, had set out to divide the nation on sectarian grounds, and he was very. This. This really marked his thinking and made, a, I believe, a huge impact on his approach to multiculturalism and racism in the years ahead. He was, as we know, a great, camp, a great supporter of Aboriginal land rights, of course, in office as Prime Minister, views that were strongly reinforced when he toured the, toured the Northern Territory as a minister, as Education Minister, with Billy Wentworth, who was then the Minister uh, for uh, the Indigenous Affairs, or whatever the department was called, called at that time. He, his treatment and welcoming of Vietnamese refugees was, and I say this without a tinge of partisanship, in contrast to that of the previous Labor government. In that respect, uh, Fraser was very critical of the Whitlam government for not being generous enough to refugees from Vietnam. So in government, this so-called conservative this, uh, you know, this stiff uh, member of the establishment had, had a much more generous approach than any of his predecessors. And in that sense, as you can see with multiculturalism, with immigration, with anti-racism, he was very, very much ahead of his time, ahead of his time whether it was on the Liberal side or on the Labor side. The establishment of the special broadcasting service that has been mentioned uh, was an extraordinary innovation, unique, as far as I'm aware, 
anywhere in the world, and that was very much a creation of Malcolm Fraser, inspired, no doubt, by his adviser Petro Giorgio, who said very eloquently when Petro retired from this House, he said of Malcolm Fraser, to those who have sought to denigrate Malcolm Fraser, I just want to say one thing. Malcolm Fraser's fusion of political toughness with compassion and social conscience is simply beyond their comprehension. Now, he has been criticised for not doing enough in terms of microeconomic reform. That criticism is both inaccurate up to a point, but also rather unfair. As John Howard has said and Peter Reith have both said in recent times, Malcolm Fraser, while he went into parliament as a young man, was very much there with the views and, and the attitudes of the 1950s and 1960s. Inevitably, he was imbued with the attitudes of men and women a generation older than himself, because they were his peers. And so you can't uh, look at the economic debate of 2015 and go back to 1975 um, and say, go back all those years, 40 years, and say uh, they got it wrong, they weren't progressive enough, they didn't understand it. It was, in every respect, a very, very different world. Now, during the uh, Republic debate, the Republic campaign, as the Prime Minister observed, uh, Malcolm Fraser was, was deaf to the Prime Minister's eloquence and uh, thankfully supported the yes vote. And he did so with his old friend, uh, what, who became his old friend, uh, Gough Whitlam. And I'll say a little bit about that in conclusion, but just let me say this about the Republic debate. Fraser made a remarkably energetic and thoughtful contribution to that debate. He was hyperactive. He gave speeches. He wrote articles. And he tackled one of the very key constitutional points, which was whether, under the Republican model being proposed, uh, the, 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 the scheme, as honourable members will recall, was that the Prime Minister could remove the President but not appoint the successor to the President. This was one of the safeguards built into it. And uh, he was, um, the argument was put by the monarchist side that the Queen had no obligation to act on the advice of the Prime Minister to appoint or remove a Governor-General. And Fraser, of course, having been a Prime Minister, having had real first-hand experience of constitutional crises, was able to lend the authority of his office, uh, invoking actually Robert Menzies, who commented on this same point, to lend some real authority and dignity to that debate. Uh, he made a very big contribution to the uh, Yes campaign. Um, and I, whenever we polled the ratings and uh, respect, approval of various political figures engaged in the campaign, he was at the very top. Uh, he was such a widely respected person. Can I just conclude on, on cause so, so much else has been said on, about Malcolm Fraser's illustrious life. Can I just conclude on one lesson that I think he gives to all of us? Uh, people in this line, our line of work tend to get consumed with bitterness and resentment. Often we have good cause, cause to, to be, or at least we think we do. Fraser, who had plenty of detractors and plenty of enemies, uh, was nonetheless not a hater. It was a remarkable feature of his evolution. Remember, he ceased to be Prime Minister at 52 or 53, so he was a young Prime Minister and a young ex-Prime Minister. But despite all of that tumult and all of the venom that had been expended at him, he didn't look backwards. He was focused on the issues of today and tomorrow. His last tweet, we all recall, was tweeting an article about Chinese foreign policy. He wasn't interested in getting into his anecdotage and sitting back in the armchair and talking about what might have been or who was right or wrong in the sacking of Gorton or the sacking of Whitlam. He was focused on the future, but he did so in a thoroughly positive way and in that respect gave all of us an example that we should at every stage, like Fraser and like Whitlam, drive the negativity and hatred and bitterness out of ourselves, fill it with love because that makes us stronger and makes our nation stronger. Farewell, Malcolm Fraser. The nation has lost one of its greats. We salute you. We pray for your family. They are in our prayers. And we know that your role in Australian history 
will be forever recognised as one of the greatest, one of the architects of the extraordinary nation all of us are so honoured to represent in this chamber. Yeah.